I'm the ASMR psychologist. Welcome to my channel. Now, today I'm going to be answering your questions. And these are the questions that you asked me in the community section of my channel. So, if this goes well, I will make this a regular feature. So, let's see. If you like it, give me an up thumb and I will know to make more videos like this. And also, you can pop any more questions that you have in the comments section of this video and I'll also maybe post something again in the community section so you can go there to ask as well. But let's see what you've been asking me. Okay, so let's go. I'm going to start from the newest ones, sorry, the oldest ones first, make it fair. Okay, so the first question is where do you live? So I live in the UK um, for a long time. I lived in London, I was born there. I'm fifth, sixth generation Londoner. But I moved out of London, just outside of London, probably about six or seven years ago. I have quite a large family. I have four young boys, so we needed a bit more space, but we made sure that we didn't go too far because I do like the hustle and bustle. I actually live quite near to a busy road and most people I don't think out here in the country like that, but I like it. I like the, the life. It doesn't make for a good environment for making ASMR videos. I do have to use an app to filter out the road noise, but I like it. I find it quite soothing, that constant hum in the background. Okay, let's see the next question. The phone's gone off. Okay, here we go. So. Okay, my obvious question would be to ask how you became interested in psychology and, more specifically, when did you first hypnotise someone? Really interested in the answer. Thanks, as always. It's not a very interesting story, I'm afraid. Um, so, one of my teachers, I think her name is Mrs McAllister, um, suggested that um, I went to university and studied an undergraduate degree in psychology. To be a psychologist, you have to do a three-year undergraduate degree and then there's between two to five years of an apprenticeship and then you do your doctorate which is another degree uh, where it's a combination of um, teaching and and research and you do rotations in various different hospitals anyway mrs McAllister suggested that i went and did an undergraduate degree in psychology which is quite different to the clinical psychology that I practice now, and if I'm honest, I remember very little of what I learnt in those lectures. Um, and I think some clinical psychologists came to talk to us and told us about a career in psychology, and I thought, hmm, it sounds interesting. I was really young, um, and I think couldn't really think of anything else to do. It seemed an obvious path at that point. And I did my, so it was, I trained for nine years in total. And it was okay. I was never massively passionate about it until I qualified. And I went and worked in a service, an eating disorder service actually. And something changed there. Suddenly I just, I really, really got into it. I felt more confident that the boss that I had um, was very supportive and he encouraged me to be creative and flexible. I did a lot of research and I spoke a lot at um, sort of conferences and I published lots of papers and 
I just kind of found my own way of doing psychology. Um, yeah, I, I actually worked, you, you train in the NHS in the UK and then I worked there for a number of years. I ran a service and then um, I left to start my own private practice and I now run a, a national service. We have clinics across the country. Um, and what I like about that is there is just a little bit more flexibility. We can individualise care for people a little bit more. So, mm, I can't remember the rest of your question. Hold on a minute. Something about hypnosis. What's that? Something about hypnosis. <laughs> okay, yes, of course, I know this uh, This guy. He often comment about, ask questions about um, my hypnosis. The first person I hypnotise, so the thing about hypnosis is it's it's not a standalone treatment. Um, I think it, it does need to be used in conjunction with other therapies, uh, for example, cognitive behavioural therapy, which is a very effective talking therapy. So I was taught hypnosis on my clinical psychology training course. I don't know if this was the first person I hypnotised, but I, it, it sticks in my mind. I was working with a, a slightly older woman. She was maybe in her 50s, and uh, she'd been suffering from tinnitus, I think, most of her life. And also agoraphobia. And she was very, very stuck, and we really weren't getting anywhere. And she was pretty much living in one room in her house. The, the sort of more traditional approaches, the cognitive behavioural ther therapy approaches, oh, they just wouldn't really, well, we couldn't get out of the, the starting blocks. And kind of in desperation, I think, I tried some hypnosis. And it, uh, it didn't cure her, but it did unstick her. And it enabled her to take those first few steps and, and trust herself to take a few risks. And and from there we, we continue to use the hypnosis Sort of combining it throughout the treatment And from that point onwards she did start to move forward And, and make some really important changes Have I answered all your questions? Let's just check I have to put the I'm using my partner's phone here Because I'm recording on my phone And I have to keep putting his security code in um, Okay so that's your question Okay, next question. What do you do for a hobby? Okay, so there's three questions here. What are my hobbies? Why do people wake up sometimes in the middle of the night? And do I have any animals? Okay, so hobbies. Not many at the moment. I think I mentioned before I've got four young children. Um, but I do. I'm quite into yoga. I do do a lot of yoga. Um, I have some back issues, I uh, have scoliosis, and so I have a spinal fusion, runs from about here to here, um, and I think at that point when I had my operation I got very into yoga, so I do that daily, not in a formal way, I don't go to classes or anything, but I do little bits and bobs throughout the day, That's, and I like the whole kind of approach to life, um, you know, I do a lot of videos on mindfulness, mindfulness meditation, so I guess that's probably my most significant hobby. What was your next question about waking in the middle of the night? Um, so, I don't know if you've seen the sleep clinic where I talk about um, the sleep cycles and the various stages of sleep. There are four stages of sleep. And we kind of move in between them throughout the night. Um, you begin in light sleep and then you drop down into deeper stages of sleep and then you come back up into REM and then you drop back down again and after you've been in REM which is kind of up here closest to consciousness you it you do momentarily wake up now a lot of the time because we cycle through one of these cycles every 45 minutes most of the time you you kind of don't realize you've woken up because you just sort of dip into consciousness and dip back down again but if there is uh, something in your environment enough to draw you a little further out of consciousness, that's when you would wake up and become fully conscious. So it might mean it might be that you're hungry, you need the loo, or 
when we're a bit stressed, we're worried about something that will just pull us a little bit further into consciousness. So that's often the reason that we wake up. Something in our environment just pulls us out of sleep as we approach consciousness. Also, pain, feeling unwell can pull us out as well. So there's usually a reason. I do think the most common reason is stress and anxiety and uh, it is uh, a symptom that's often used to di diagnose that and depression actually is waking frequently throughout the night. And what was your last one? Do I have animals I think? Was it, was it that? Do I have animals? I do. Let me just check. I have, I have a cat. We got her first. Her name's Pepper. She's a rescue cat. I got her. I think she was about four months old. Um, she was living in a two-bedroom flat with a woman who had 16 cats. And I think the council came and said, mm, no, you can have two. So we rescued her. And then a few months later, much to her horror, actually, initially, we got a puppy. Um, it was actually, I know you're not supposed to do this, but I got it for the children for Christmas last year. And she's a multi poo. And when we got her, she could sit in the palm of my hand. She was all fluffy, like a teddy bear. She's actually got um, an Instagram account. I don't, I don't post on there regularly, but she has got an Instagram account um, at Pickle the Multi Poo, and she's just a darling. She's very, very sweet. And now the cat is in love with her as well. They sleep together every night. It's very lovely. And uh, I mean, she's she's a really good beginner's dog because. She doesn't need much exercise, but she loves to go for a walk. She's got a very good temperament. She's, um, so a multi-poo is a, a Maltese bred with a toy poodle, and poodles are really intelligent, so she's very easy to train. Um, she just sort of trots alongside my buggy. Ah, oh, she's lovely, she's darling, and she doesn't shed either, so there's no hair everywhere, so she's a nice clean dog. Um, she does bring me mice from time to time, and can't understand why I'm not very happy about that, because they're never dead, they're always alive, always. and it's just because she hangs out with the cat quite a lot, and so thinks that, you know, that's what you do, but anyway, I have a dog and a cat, oh, and the, the dog's name, did I say, is, is Pickle, yes I did, because I told you about the Instagram account, okay, what else, what else, what else, what else, okay, so this is, what is something you would want to tell people who are interested in studying clinical psychology, or what would you want to tell your past self if you had the chance? I am looking into the different studies within psychology for myself, and I'd love to pick the brains of someone who has already studied, but I never really had the chance. This is an interesting one. What I would say is our choice of career, a little like our choice of partner, tells us a lot about our issues. We're often drawn into careers to try and resolve something, sort something out. And when I meet someone for the first time, I always am very interested in what they do and what their partner's like. It tells me a lot about their personality. So I think people are often, and I probably include myself in this, drawn into clinical psychology in the hope that it will help them to understand themselves a little better. To a certain extent it does, but if you are going to be a therapist of any type, it's really important that you work on yourself separately to your studies. So that is what I would say to somebody who's studying psychology, because in many courses it's encouraged, but it's not necessarily compulsory. And particularly if I've got much money, I think I can't afford to do that. But I think it's key to being a good therapist. You need to fully understand, <coughs> excuse me, you need to fully understand yourself so that you know what stuff belongs to your patients and what stuff belongs to you. Because the therapeutic relationship, when you're counselling someone, doing therapy with someone, is really intense and you get very tangled up with them. And it can be hard if you don't truly understand yourself and you're not working on yourself regularly, on a weekly basis, in your own therapy, to separate yourself out from that. So... And I guess the other thing is, it's it's quite intense being a therapist. You know, you hear a lot of quite difficult, upsetting things. I think burnout is very high in psychologists, so you need that for yourself. 
if this type of career is going to be sustainable. But that answers your question. Okay. So Cody Code comes in again. And what have we got? Next. Okay, how to tell if you need to see a professional on how to ask for help. I think if you're asking that question, it's probably worth going to see somebody. Trust yourself. You know, if you are questioning whether or not you need extra help more than your friends and family can offer you, you probably do. And you know, if you go and you realise you don't need that extra help, what have you lost? I would say to always err on the side of caution. Whether it's your physical or your mental health, go and get it checked out. Um, kind of more objectively, um, maybe you're thinking about the problems that just don't go away on their own. Problems that are overwhelming you, interfering with your life. Mm, but I think the overarching kind of thing to consider or think about is if it pops into your mind then it's probably worth going to speak to somebody. You've really got nothing to lose. But make sure that they are properly trained and qualified. I think there's a lot of well-meaning people out there who can actually do more harm than good. So make sure that the person is well-trained, You, they're able to tell you what their training is and that they are a member of a professional body which monitors there, there were. Okay. okay, what's next? Um, okay, what are your thoughts on digital app based therapy services? And then part two, what are your favourite techniques for managing anxiety? So I think there's definitely a place for apps. Um, you know, not everybody can access a therapist. Location, you know, money, all these things get in the way. But the thing to remember is that an app isn't going to be tailored to your individual needs. So they will help to some extent, but don't be surprised if it's not sorting the problem out completely. You know, maybe it's a good starting point and it's better, certainly better than nothing. But if it doesn't work for you, that doesn't mean that something else won't. But ideally, you know, you want a therapist, properly qualified therapist who can assess you and individually tailor a treatment program for you. Um, favourite, what was it, favourite? Oh dear, my phone has gone completely now. Favourite, uh, relaxation. Favourite technique for managing anxiety. So, I guess this is the same for most problems. You have a, there's two levels to therapy. Your first level is helping somebody to, uh, manage their symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis, rebalancing them, if you like. And then the second phase is looking at the factors that have made them vulnerable to developing the problem in the first place. You know, problems don't hit people randomly. Something would have happened in your earlier experiences which will have made you vulnerable and it's really important to address that so that the problems don't return. So for the first phase of therapy, I think it's probably for anxiety breathing because it's so simple, so accessible and portable. And it's a really, really good way to turn off your sympathetic nervous system, which is obviously the part of the nervous system that um, provokes anxiety, and turn on your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the nervous system for resting and relaxing. And there's, there's actually been some research um, that shows how our mood, our state of mind, 
is reflected in our breathing. So if your breathing is steady and slow and calm, your, your mood will be similar. So it's quite a, a powerful technique. For the second phase of therapy, so looking at those factors that have made you vulnerable, my... I, I mean, I will... It very much depends on the person, but I try and individually tailor treatment programs but I do always draw quite heavily on um, an extended version of CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, called Schema Focus CBT, which helps to address the kind of the day-to-day -day thoughts that we have that trigger negative emotions, but it also looks at the experiences from the past that have sort of got us where, where we are today, that have influenced how we make sense of our current world. Uh, it's a very effective treatment and it has a good solid research base which I think is always important when you're doing this type of work. Okay. What's the difference between healthy ambition and workaholism? workaholism. <laughs> Interestingly, it's not the amount of time you spent working. It's why you do it. So if your self-esteem is dependent upon a number of things, work being one of them, but work, relationships, hobbies, and you're driven in your work, then that is healthy ambition. But if your self-esteem is solely dependent on your work, and when that's not going well, you just push harder and harder and harder. That would be the definition of a workaholic, so that your self-esteem is so comprehensively tied to what happens at work that you're fully dependent upon it. Your emotional well-being is fully dependent upon it. So it's not necessarily quantity, but more quality. Um, now, do you know, I'm just going to, I've got, I don't think I'm just aware of the time, um, I'm not going to have a chance to look at all these questions, but there is one I'm going to skip to that I saw earlier, because I know there is a couple of people have asked me about this. What do you think about this famous ASMR artist quitting ASMR? She feels that, this is a quote, ASMR doesn't help you. She feels it is a stimulant and a distraction, and it doesn't help you solve your problems. So no, a few people have asked me about this. Oh. Okay, so what I would say is I did watch this video um, and I know at the beginning the artist states that there's loads of evidence to suggest something or other. Firstly, there isn't. <laughs> so there was a, there's a question mark, I think, to begin with over what she's saying here. There have been 11 to date, 11 research studies published, properly published in journals, peer-reviewed journals, looking at ASMR, and none of them support anything that she is saying. Actually, the opposite. Um, ASMR triggers um, brain chemicals that are incredibly good for us, dopamine, endorphins, melatonin, that's the one that helps you sleep. It is more akin to things like relaxation and meditation. You, know, you don't hear people saying, oh, I'm meditating too much, this must be bad. The beauty of ASMR is that you can't get addicted to it in the way that we think about addictions. I think what this artist does is, is kind of misunderstand the, the construct of addiction. Addiction is um, when you kind of compulsively engage in a behaviour that feels good in the short term but is bad for you over the longer term. And that's the beauty of ASMR. It, it, it feels really good and has lots of health benefits because of these brain chemicals, but 
there's no adverse effects, there's no side effects to it. I can only think that what she's alluding to is that she's worried people might think that ASMR is the answer to all of life's problems um, and that you don't need to address them in any other way. Now, I, I've read a few of the comments in her video and I, I don't think people are that daft. I, I don't think that people think that ASMR is the solution to all of their problems. I think people understand that you use ASMR to help you relax or to help you sleep, um, but then it's quite possible that you will also need, if the problems don't resolve on their own or, or just with the use of ASMR, that you will need to address them more comprehensively. You know, I talk about this a lot on my channel. I think ASMR has the potential when combined with existing treatments for mental health and well-being, physical health as well, to be an amazing complement and possibly even boost some of our existing treatments. I think that, you know, people say things for all sorts of reasons. Um, I'm sure she has her reasons for saying these things and believing these things. But I would always say that if something is working for you and there is no scientific evidence that you shouldn't be doing it or that it is bad for you, keep doing what you're doing. And in this case, there is no scientific evidence to support any of her claims. The opposite of that. It's great for relaxation, it's great to help you sleep, and it's actually, interestingly, if you watch ASMR in the afternoon, between about two and four, where as a part of our natural sleep cycle, we kind of get a boost of melatonin, so can often feel quite sleepy, because ASMR has triggers dopamine, it can actually kind of give you a little bit of an extra boost, a little bit of a focus. Okay, so if you're interested in um, the research around ASMR, there's a really helpful website, I don't know if you've come across it, it's called the ASMR University, and he, uh, the guy, I think his name's, mm, what's his name, Craig, something, I can't remember, uh, anyway, look him up, look him up, um, the ASMR University, he um, lists and updates it regularly, it looks like all the articles that have been written on ASMR, all the articles that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, and he puts a link so you can go and read the actual article, but he also does a nice little summary because some of these articles are quite long and dry, so if you're not quite up for reading them, you can read his summary but and still feel that you're kind of keeping up to date uh, with what the research is saying. It's very, very early days for ASMR research-wise. It's been largely overlooked by mental health professionals, uh, physical health professionals um, and academics. But I've noticed that is starting to change. Um, so I think moving forward, we're going to be finding out lots more about ASMR. Um, but initial research would suggest that what is talked about in this video is not accurate. So I think we can take it with a pinch of salt. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, um, if you'd like me to talk more about this, this video, you know, let me know and I'm sure I can do that. Um, now, what I'm going to do is, I know that, I, I'm not sure how many questions I answered, but I know that there's still quite a lot more um, to be answered. Um, so, I will try and work through these, maybe, next week. In the meantime, I hope that this was helpful. If it was helpful, let me know. Um, if you have more questions for me, pop them in the comments for this video. Um, and of course, I think as I said at the beginning of this video, I'll put something else in my um, community section. And you can pop your, your questions there for me too. Thank you for joining me today and hopefully I will see you.